I would like to introduce Dr. Chris Holsinger, who is Professor of Otolaryngology at Stanford University School of Medicine, who will introduce the other um, multidisciplinary panelists. So, thank you. Thank you, Allison, and thanks to Neveris for sponsoring this. Uh, I'm the head neck surgeon at Stanford, as Allison just mentioned, and I'm really excited to be uh, joining this panel with Glenn and uh, Bisham. We're going to introduce them uh, in a sec. From Insight to Action, a case-based discussion of the utility of a novel marker for tracking uh, circulating tumor DNA focused on HPV. Um, and uh, in case you don't know, uh, Glenn Hanna is an assistant professor of medicine, so he's our medical oncologist on the panel. Uh, so we're going to hear from him a little bit later about uh, distant and other disease. Uh, Bishop Chera he is now at the University uh, Medical University of South Carolina, where he's a professor of radiation oncology and also has an appointment of otolaryngology as well. And um, here are the disclosures for the group. I'm going to be monitoring this session, but I don't have a consultancy with uh, Navaris. I'm just very interested in this space because my practice, probably like yours, is overwhelmed with uh, HPV-associated oropharynx cancer. So. Everyone knows now uh, in our field of head and neck oncology that um, HPV disease is transforming our practices. Uh, in the Bay Area, 98% um, of our patients are uh, P16 HPV positive, and I would roughly estimate that about 60% of the patients that come through our practice now are oropharynx cancer. Uh, that is a doubling of what we saw sort of growing up. And, uh, coming into the specialty. In 2010, Kian Ang showed this classic paper uh, showing the unique histology um, and uh, biology of HPV-associated cancers, um, showing a significant 25% increase in overall survival for HPV-associated cancers that you see here on, on the left, and also for progression-free survival, um, and these HPV-negative cancers um, are faring much, much worse. Um, and, and so at least in my practice, and, and I'm going to pull the audience here in a second to see if this is the same, but I think the very presence of everyone here actually attests that we're all struggling to figure out how to deal with these patients uh, as good as we can. Um, this is sort of um, providing a lot of new opportunities for research, but also requires us to think a little bit differently because we kind of came up and grew up in this HPV negative era, and we have this new disease that supposedly performs better and should have better outcomes and oftentimes does, but how we manage those patients to get them there with decreased toxicity and not losing um, uh, any survival is, is I think the real challenge. Um, despite the good outcome though, um, as many as 15 to 20 percent of these patients will have some sort of local regional and or distant failure and in fact as, as much as a third of, of the patients have first sites of recurrence, even for HPV-positive disease, probably because there's lower local regional failure distantly. So how do we surveil for that? How do we monitor for that? How do we stratify treatment initially for these HPV-positive cancers? Uh, I think the sort of old way of doing things that I think is nicely summarized here in the NCCN, where uh, these poor patients who are probably going to be cured come into our clinic in the first year, every six weeks, I've seen uh, in some practices. In our practices, it's probably every three months. And then that's tapered out. But are, is that too much? And uh, can we find a better way to, instead of bringing these patients in, find perhaps using a circulating uh, t uh, uh, serum or plasma marker to stratify surveillance and measure treatment uh, response? Because whether it's the clinical visit or our old traditional uh, means of, of imaging, and there is no real standard for that. Is it a PET? Is it a CT or MRI? Um, I think part of the reason we're all here today to talk about um, uh, tumor tissue modified viral DNA for these HPV positive patients because it might really uh, save a lot of time and money and anxiety on the part of the patients. I'm a head and neck surgeon, um, but we're going to now have, uh, from I think his seat over there, Bisham Shera talk a little bit about what NAVDX is and how it's being um, developed as an important biomarker um, to manage things. So, Bisham. Um, so, when HPV infects an epithelial cell, uh, it exists either as an integrated into the genome or it can actually exist as episomal. 
And when you know HPV-driven cancer cells die, they die through apoptosis. And as many of you know, the apoptotic mechanism is basically these caspases chop up the DNA into very uh, different fragments, and uh, and then release. You can actually detect that in the blood, uh, and. The, the NAVDX assay actually, you know, is a very specific assay that measures a, a t tumor tissue modified viral HPV DNA. And this blood test distinguishes between actual cancer tumor derived HPV DNA versus an infection. So if this test is positive, it's not because of an infection. It's because there is HPV DNA from a cancer cell that's being released and being detected. And so this blood test is like very simple blood draw, 10 mLs. Uh, it is collected in a streck tube, which stabilizes the, the DNA material uh, for transport and analysis. And then, you know, it's spun down and the plasma is evaluated with a, a proprietary digital droplet PCR uh, uh, quantitative uh, 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 assay. And then you get a report that tells you the actual number of fragments that are detected uh, in that sample. And so you actually get absolute quantification. This is very different than the EBV viral loads that we all have uh, in our respective practices where they really can't give you an absolute quantification. They do give you a number, but you really can't follow that. Typically, it's either positive or negative, or they give you a range that it's, you know, it's detectable in this range, and so this is a positive test. So, you know, how, what is the, accuracy, sensitivity, sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, negative predictive value of this blood test compared to what we already do in the clinic for, for detecting HPV cancers and in detecting recurrences for our patients. You know, physical exam, endoscopy really is not very good at, at detecting cancer recurrences uh, in, in, pa in patients with or HPV-driven or Frank's cancer. What about the PET scan? PET scan is probably the, one of the most expensive tests we order, uh, and it does look at the entire body. Uh, and, you know, it's better than physical exam, but, you know, the positive root value of, of a PET CT is not that great. Neither is a sensitivity or specificity. But the data that's been generated now with, with, with the NAVDX here, I'm showing, we're showing that it has a very high positive predictive value, negative predictive value, uh, sensitivity and specificity. And so this blood test it has a broad, broad applicability across the entire continuum of care for our eight patients with HPV or pharynx cancer. I think there, we think there's great utility in the pretreatment setting in determining the actual HPV status. Uh, and, and that this pretreatment baseline TTMV value can actually be used as a prognostic marker. Uh, and then during treatment for monitoring response in the definitive radiotherapy session, uh, setting and also in the definitive surgery setting. And then after treatment, this blood test has utility in surveilling uh, patients for cancer recurrence. And so what we're going to do now is we're really going to uh, go into cases and show you the data for each, each one of these clinical scenarios, pretreatment, monitoring during treatment, and post-treatment. Talk about the data that supports the use of, of, of uh, circulating tumor HPV DNA. And then we're going to go through some practical cases uh, of, of, real, of real patients uh, that we've uh, treated. So in the pretreatment setting, uh, you, we, the, the first part of, 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 of a patient's journey is you get diagnosed with cancer. Uh, and so how can this blood test help in, in the beginnings of uh, that journey? So in the pretreatment setting, how often is this NADDX, a, a HPV DNA a detectable with the NADDX assay? It's about 90%. Uh, and this 90% detectability uh, is, was shown here and proven in this, uh, this uh, prospective longitudinal three-year study uh, that was conducted across a multicenter study of about 200 patients. And so what you see here is that on the right side of the, of the graph is the number of patients in the study that had a positive uh, uh, CT DNA. And this assay detects several high-risk subtypes, 16, 18, 31, 33, and 35. Um, and uh, there were, you know, when you... When you when you look at this data, you're like, well, it wasn't, it wasn't detectable in 100% of patients, right? These are all P16 positive or pharynx cancer. So what about the 10% in which it's an undetectable pretreatment? Why is that happening? Is it because the test is false negative? Uh, we don't think so. Uh, it could be that, you know, the HPV is integrated. And we, there's data that, that I won't show here, but there's data out there showing that when you can't detect CT DNA in the blood, it's the HPV genome is most likely integrated than episomal. It could be that, that these are not really HPV-driven cancers. You can have P16 positivity in squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck, and there not be HPV uh, causing that. And so just like many of us, this sort of assay just kind of showed up one day and uh, was open-minded, um, you know, in the way that I think robotics and, and laser surgery has helped us manage as surgeons this, this disease. 
I'm going to present one, one of these first cases that I saw that really kind of actually interested me because it seemed to be an accurate representation of the rather large scale disease that this gentleman from the San Joaquin uh, Valley um, in, in California presented with. But before I do that, um, I, this is the American Head and Neck uh, Society, not the American Head and Neck. How many of us here today are head and neck surgeons, practicing surgeons? Okay, wow, so not surprisingly majority. How about any uh, medical oncologists like Dr. Hannah here? Are there any? No? You're, <laughs> You're it. Glenn, you I'm can it. say whatever I you want. I can say whatever I want. Right? It is sweet. Sweet. Free, free reign. And then how about radiation oncology? Some rad onks in there. Thank you for coming to our meeting, by the way. And then how about other specialties that I might not have mentioned, like SLP or, yeah, a couple hands back there. Okay, great. So this is a gentleman who walks into my clinic, and he's 63. He is pretty much an active smoker. He quit, you know, yesterday. And it's one of those things where I, I was able to get him in, and, of course, the referring uh, person was like, hey, this is, seems really exophytic. Maybe you could do the, ro do the robot on him. And I'm like, oh, it's, it's, I don't know if this projects really well, but this is a massive tonsil cancer. I mean, it's at least a T3 uh, moves. It's really big. Uh, some nodes here as well. And obviously, he's not a great candidate for surgery. Um, I don't know, maybe Mike Keeney can take it out with his skills. But um, uh, I decided that, you know, chemo RT really kind of made the most sense. So we staged him as T3 and 1. Um, and he went on to have uh, concurrent chemo radiation um, uh, with two um, 100 milligram per middle squared boluses with uh, our partners in, um, in Turlock. And he came back to see me about two to three months later. Uh, I hadn't really seen him. He lives close by to this outside facility. Um, but he comes back because there's a PET scan at three months that's hot and positive, saying, oh, well, maybe you actually need to, to do an operation after all. I see him. Uh, I take a look at the PET scan. But, you know, it's an outside scan, so I can't really see it that day. I examine him. It's an amazing response. Like, there's this very large tumor. Uh, and I was, wow, I need to see this guy back because salvage may be necessary. But there is definitely this little ulceration sort of where the anterior tonsillar pillars inserting in the tongue base, so the front part of the tumor. And I can't tell if it's mucositis or a burn from, from his treatment or whatever. But it, it looks inflammatory rather than neoplastic. But I don't really know kind of what to do next. And, you know, uh, this is a gentleman who uh, did not have insurance, but we were able to get him into a program that we have. And I was able to order uh, his NAVDX. It was 27000 um, which was exorb that to me that seemed really high. <laughs> um, uh, and I've been using this for a couple years now. It's the, certainly the highest I've seen. And I thought, oh well, gosh, I wonder even though if his baseline imaging was negative for distant disease, that you know there's a big tumor, but there's probably micromets. Who knows what's happening with him? Chris, it, was that drawn before the oper uh, before chemo radiation or after chemo radiation? Thank you for clarifying. That was pre-treatment. So when he came in, I was able to get this done at Stanford bef before he went to our outside facility. And maybe Lynn. just an important point. Yeah. A lot of people ask, does the level of value correlate with disease burden? At this moment, that's not a clear association. What I would argue is that an individual patient's trend over time is more important than comparing a value between patients. You can't be comfortable with someone's value at 60 or someone's value at 27,000 about where the disease is and the burden of disease. And some of that has to do, if you think biologically, about the shed factor, the apoptosis, and how we intrinsically biologically deal with things. So be careful. It's not about quantitation, and some of our work, Eleni Reddig and others have looked at this. We know higher levels predict nodal involvement at baseline, but we don't know that higher levels mean distant disease or when someone has metastatic disease, what that means, and we'll show you that. So yeah. important. And so he went all the way to zero, uh, essentially at three months. And so I had seen uh, Eleni's paper, and I thought, well, wow, this is a really big primary, but pretty average volume neck disease. This was a really... Uh, clinically useful scenario for me to have this biomarker um, because you know I was a lot more comfortable. I'm still seeing him clinically, but you know in the set in the setting of a positive PET scan and this negative test, which is still you know something that I'm taking into account as a possible clinical value. Right? I mean, we need to evaluate this as a community of head neck oncologists. Um, it actually put my mind at ease, and, and certainly that of of of, of the patient and family. 
Um, and I'm glad Glenn corrected me because I was like, wow, 27,000 is a really, that's a lot, right? It's just just, just wait tip. for the metastatic cases. That's right. <laughs> I was impressed. But I want you to remember that number as we look at some surgical cases uh, just, just down the road. So um, we'll pause there for any questions from the audience um, for just a second, if there are any about that case or the intro. No? I did just want to make a comment because it's really critical at this point. For the 10% of patients who are HPV undetectable on the NAVDX assay at baseline, when you know, when you're confident there's a tumor in front of you, you have P16 and HPV-ish positivity. That does occur, right? It's not a perfect evaluation. You do want to check the box to reflex test the tumor tissue. So not only does NAVDX provide blood testing, if you detect it in the tumor tissue subsequently, you should still follow the test. It just means that there was no shedding at that time. If someone is a double negative, nothing on baseline despite presence of disease and you're convinced it's HPV positive, and the tissue testing is negative, we have found from our vast experience at Farber and elsewhere that it doesn't necessarily, it's not a great option for relying on the test long term. But that's a small, small percentage of patients. As you heard, 90% will be detectable at baseline, and then probably another large chunk of that 10% will have detectability on tissue at baseline, and you should still follow it. Yeah, question. I did not. Um, my, but, well, my clinical intuition was that, hey, this is uh, resolving mucositis, that little burn that you'll get sometimes from the anterior tonsillar pillars inserting the tongue base. I'm still seeing him every two months, and we'll probably repeat his pet um, at, at six months. But, um, but, that, uh, but yeah, so I, I was just more comfortable with my decision. It didn't necessarily change my decision. The question from our colleague from Germany in the front was that, um, did I go ahead and biopsy that patient with the positive PET and what seemed to be an inflammatory lesion? And the answer is no, uh, obviously, as, as, as you heard me respond. The Key and Ang paper that helped us really see this difference in prognosis was really driven by a P16 immunohistochemical biomarker. And there was some measurement of in situ DNA hybridization of HPV in that study. And I think what... Uh, Bisham just, just, just introduced us to, and what the point that Glenn just made is, as, ref, as managing head and neck surgical oncologist, probably getting a P16 immunohistochemical team in the future is not going to be enough. I'm not a pathologist, um, but it seems that we're really going to need to know that this is an HPV intruvent, especially if there's a question that a, a biopsy like NAVDX is going to try to help us resolve. But we, that's going to have to fall on our shoulders. But Claudio. Um. I don't know if we're going to present other cases, but I, I was wondering in the situation of an unknown primary, uh, this would be very useful to have it beforehand. What do you think about it? Uh, yes, I just had a case just like that um, where it was an unknown primary. The medical decision making was, oh, this is a recurrent skin cancer, do an operation, get a PET scan, oh, there's a retropharyngeal node. Never seen a retropharyngeal node in a metastatic squame from a skin. NAVDX positive, you know, and then we confirmed with a P16 on the tissue that was taken out with the initial surgery. So I think there's value in that. Absolutely. We've seen several cases over the last few years at the Farber with similar scenario. We feel more confident, far more confident with a baseline positive test with like a level two node where you're not sure and that patient has a skin cancer history. I did want to just answer the top question. The rest were sort of answering, but can this be used in lieu of uh, traditional ish or PCR testing. I wouldn't say it's used in lieu of, but if you think about it, it provides much more enriched information. Because one thing I would challenge the current pathology standard is, if you are P16 positive at our institution, we reflex to ish, and that ish is a 1618 probe, and that's it. So then we know it's HPV positive, and it's the likely high risk subtype 16 or 18. But what this test provides is the five high risk subtypes actually matching to the subtype. So what's been fascinating for me, and Bish can comment in Chris too, over the last several years, we've picked up on tons of HPV 31, 33. And so I would argue, my hypothesis is, those are not going to behave exactly the same. I bet you that those cases where it's a small, prim big primary and small cystic nodes might not be HPV 16 positive, or that by smoking, you might actually be at prone for different HPV subtypes. So for those of you who are researchers, this is a huge space. How do people actually behave with non-16 subtypes as opposed to 
31, 33, 35, and Navaris, I'm sure, is gonna be working on probes for the other high-risk subtypes, I'm told. Uh, and so keep that in mind. That's very valuable epidemiologic information, and we don't see the same sites uh, across the country. Geographic distributions, sometimes 18 is more prevalent in the south or across seas, and in, in New England, we see 31, 33. So just something to keep in mind. Yeah. I don't know, Bisham, if you have other comments, but I, I was gonna, yeah. Yeah, I was going to respond a little bit to, uh, to to Glenn's statement earlier. You know, I always, uh, and it's funny you said this about the shedding, um, which I've read but not really connected. So many of us will do parathyroid surgery, and we know that when we measure intraoperative parathyroid hormone, what's Holsinger talking about parathyroids in this conference for? But <laughs> but I'm going to go stay with me here. So we are we are not to touch the neck before we do intraoperative um a PTH monitoring before we go look for a parathyroid. And as part of my exam, I pretty carefully palpate that tumor to see if it's fixed or whatever. And so perhaps my exam was why it was 27,000, right? I mean, so maybe I need to be ordering this before I do a, a manual palpation. Who knows? Um, so where this has been really helpful, and we don't have a slide on this, uh, but it is about the unknown primary tumor, is that Oftentimes, we struggle as the head and neck surgical oncologist to get a diagnosis for someone that has an unknown primary tumor um, and a cystic node. And you, if you're not doing it yourself, you send it to the pathologist, and they're saying, well, it's cystic uh, uh, debris. And so, oh, well, please send a, a PCR for HPV, and it's negative. Th this is where sending that test, although, although it would be nice to get it back a little faster, has been really helpful to say, no pathology, please go back so I don't have to do an excisional lymph node biopsy. This, there, this is a, a NABDX positive tumor. Let's go back and keep um, trying to get an appropriate core or other FNA to do that. A question for you guys. Um, I've been actually using NABDX for an HPV-driven non-oropharynx cancers like sinonasal, mm. and I'm seeing like similar like pretreatment positivities and trends. Yes, I we are doing the same, and actually we have a prospective surveillance study that Eleni Reddig and I um, have worked on for several years, and the data should be ready soon. But we struggled with including some sinonasal HPV-positive patients, as you know. To be very clear, those are P16 positive-ish positive, so there's some evidence in oral cavity at small percentages that that's a real phenomenon, and we too have seen some shed in that case. Keeping in mind, though, that even though that may be HPV driven, that's a biologically distinct subset, and so you can use the assay, but you want to apply different sort of rules for your therapy. Yeah, yeah and I, I don't do a lot of inverting sinus pap, but I don't do a lot of rhinology anymore. So, yeah. um, so, but I mean, and Dan, nasopharynx too. I was yeah, going to say I've yeah. seen it positive. Dan positive. Faden has an interesting case report where I think he had using his own assay a, a positive a circulating tumor DNA. For does tours persists, and he later then finds an inverting papilloma associated with squamous cell carcinoma in the in the nose. We've right. also found clear uh, failure to clear after in a case that yeah. ended up having a synchronous G, GYN malignancy in a woman. Yeah. So that was HPV associated. Right. Yeah. So now, what about during treatment? Is there value in uh, you know checking uh, using NABDX during treatment? And uh, there is data uh, in the definitive chemo radiotherapy setting and also surgical setting. So this is a, a, a prospective uh, study that was done. Uh, patients on this study all were getting de-intensified chemo radiotherapy. They had P16 positive or pharynx cancer, and uh, TTMV was checked pre-treatment and weekly during radiotherapy. And what it, the primary objective was to look at clearance kinetics during chemo radiotherapy to see if you could correlate clearance kinetics with a prognosis, particularly uh, recurrence-free survival. Uh, re regional diseases for free survival, sorry. And what, what was shown in this study was that you, the clearance kinetics, are, there's, there's, two, there's two basic, two kinds of clearance kinetics. There's what we, was something called rapid clearance kinetics, where you have a baseline, pretreatment value is high, 200 in this study. Uh, pick, that was picked math for mathematical median. But, um, and then by week four, if it becomes undetectable, or close to 95% undetectable a clearance, those patients were classified as having favorable clearance kinetics. And, here you can see in the Kaplan-Meier curve that that top line is those, is those patients who had a favorable clearance kinetics, and um, they did, uh, they did uh, very, very well. And then there's another type of clearance kinetics kind of delayed, meaning that by week four, it's not 95% clear. It's you know, more, something like 90% clear, 80% clear, 50% cleared. And those, those, those tumors that had an unfavorable clearance kinetics had a, had a, were associated with a higher incidence of a regional disease recurrence. 
And in the surgical setting, this is a study done by the Mayo Clinic in uh, Rochester where they looked at their patients treated on DART. They actually had blood collected, and TTMV was, uh, was checked pre-surgery, pre then post-surgery before radiation. Okay, so this is data that two-week post-op visit before you get radi radiate go on to see the radiation oncologist, they checked the blood for TTMV. And this is showing that if a patient has detectable TTMV after TORS or TLM, uh, post-surgery pre-radiation, if it's detectable at that point, that that's strongly correlated with progression-free survival and also overall survival. Uh, and interestingly, if you look at this data even more and you talk to the Mayo Clinic co colleagues, it was really the patients who were de-intensified that this really affected, meaning that possibly when there's further confirmation with further studies that are com ongoing, that if your immediate post-op CT, HPV, DNA, TTMV is positive, maybe we should not be de-intensifying those patients. And actually, we do not de-intensify those patients based on our experience and have modified an ongoing trial for patients who are post-op and are still detectable. I wanted to make two points because this is very important. For those people who comment on the work of NAVDX, the, these studies that Bish just showed are prospectively designed trials using the assay. So it is false to say that there is no evolving prospective data for this assay. Let's just be very clear about that. There is a lot of retrospective data, but you just saw two well-published uh, studies using this assay that were prospectively designed with more to come. And the second thing I just wanted to point out was people ask how fast does, does the, what's the half-life of this? Very fast. This is apoptotic shed DNA that's rapidly degraded hours. And that's been recapitulated in several DDPCR assays, not even just NAVDX, so the Faden lab and others. So you would expect to see clearance even in post-op day one in most cases. And it, it's a very different disease to, and, and, and it's, to me that was remarkable, that the good responders that are, are going to benefit from chemo RT have this response at four weeks was fairly remarkable to me. Um, but how does this sort of play out in, in a surgical patient? Um, again, this, uh, to Professor Chenea's question, this a gentleman actually presented with an uh, unknown primary tumor. Um, you see the, well, it probably doesn't project that well, but this is his initial endoscopy. This is a 50-year-old gentleman with this sort of very subtle lesion here, and essentially one four by three uh, centimeter lymph node. Um, and he's 50, so we're hoping for frontline surgery to minimize the late side effects of radiation therapy. Um, and even though there was this very subtle a asymmetry that you, you see here, I was able to identify the tumor. But what was interesting about him, he has this one node and, you know, uh, very typical. And we, it's hard for us to predict the number of nodes that are involved. And, in fact, it's hard for us to really measure the extent of disease. But in, in this patient, he did not just have this single node here, but there were five out of the 34 nodes that I removed. Um, and after a resection, given the five nodes without the extra nodal extension, he went on to have um, a postoperative concurrent chemo radiation. And just to contrast how we're going to see this used for chemo RT cases, in this gentleman, um, he went from a, a measured level of 194 to um, immediately post-RT. And unfortunately, I did not get an immediate post-op level. Um, he he uh, went all the way down to zero. Now, he's only about six months out, so we're going to repeat that. Um, well, no, he's six months for treatment. But we're going to repeat that with the planned follow-up um, that, that we have moving forward. But it's interesting to me how this assay does correlate with the extended disease, whether that's the neck or the primary, independent of my physical exam. And then um, uh, another, um, uh, uh, another case presentation um, that, again, shows the variability of this disease, um, even though it's the same staging, um, the ultimately this patient um, ends up with a, a T1N1, just like the last patient. Slightly smaller node, three by two by one. Uh, there's a, a clear tonsil mass. This patient undergoes surgery. Um, I got 16 nodes, uh, expected a little bit more. Found only one node and with good margins, um, this patient was simply uh, observed. And while this is the same stage of disease, his pre-treatment, pre-op um, uh, NAVDX was two and he's come all the way down to zero and has stayed there. Um, so for me, um, this supported the a decision not to radiate that patient um, based on his age. That's what we're leaning for anyway. 
Um, but it's sort of reinforcing, uh, it's an assay, uh, an objective assay that's starting to reinforce some, uh, reinforce some of our clinical uh, judgments and, and, and sense for what should happen with these patients. So just to sort of complicate the scenario um, and building on that approach, now we're going to talk about a patient during treatment where you might say to me, Glenn, how would you use this sort of to not necessarily modify my therapy, but complement my therapeutic approach and monitoring? So this is a traditional complex patient, 74, history of uh, co uh, competing diagnosis of smoldering myeloma that had been treated, so a modulated immune system, also a history of ankyovasculitis, so it was off immunosuppression. Why is that relevant? Think about that. That means HPV virus is growing up and cancer is growing up in an immunosuppressed individual, and many of you know that that's a more concerning situation. So this patient was staged initially, um, or, or underwent surgery because we were hoping to avoid, praying to avoid chemotherapy. We knew he was gonna need myeloma therapy and didn't wanna uh, subject him to long-term neuropathy. Uh, so he goes to surgery with traditional tours and ipsilateral neck dissection and unfortunately, as you see there, his disease is ugly. I mean, this is a, you wouldn't look at this, I guarantee, if you're honest with yourself and think this was an HPV positive patient based on that scan. This looks like an ugly sort of multi-station, minimally, or largely necrotic, but not cystic nodes in the neck, which looks HPV negative, but this was HPV positive. And the patient underwent uh, platinum radiation, unfortunately, because as you can see, there was uh, more disease than, than, we, than met the eye at the time. He says, grossly ENE positive, multiple lymph nodes, and we were very concerned. So this was his NAVDX trend, and I'm fully admitting that I was using it a little bit more aggressively than I normally do in this setting. He was detectable at baseline, and you can see those first time points were actually post-op. So look at him, and this Chris brought this up. This was immediately post-op. He was 11. That made me very concerned, the fact that this man went to TORS I would have, and I'm, I'm saying this in all honesty, even if his path had recommended radiation, I probably would have given him chemo radiation or offered it for a positive NAVDX in his situation post-op given my experience. And I followed it very carefully and you'll see ultimately he did clear and I'm watching it very carefully, but that's just a flavor of how you might use it. Again, it not necessarily is gonna change your guideline management, but it might inform your decision making about whether or not to tip the scale towards chemo or whether whether or not you get an image or see someone back a little more frequently or how often you're sort of visualizing them. So this was a recent case of mine and we're still following him and he's now, um, he's now out of treatment. And it's sort of concordant with our clinical judgment. Right, right. And right. So it's Use it together. Yeah, exactly. So how is this informing future trials? And Bish just showed you his work, his wonderful work, showing us that there's a high risk HPV subtype profile of clearance kinetics where if you're integrated presumably with low copy number or you fail to clear, that's a concerning scenario. So John Schoenfeld and I, who's a colleague in radiation at Dana-Farber, designed this trial several years ago. It's 50% enrolled and doing very well, called REACT 1.0, because we're planning a follow-up trial already. Uh, but essentially, this is risk-adapted therapy using Bish's initial criteria and his colleagues. So for patients, I'm gonna focus on the bottom, the intermediate high risk. I'm taking T4, N2 patients, potentially T4, smokers, right? These are not the people on our TOG 1016. These are not the people in your NRG trials for deintensification. We're taking the real intermediate high-risk folks, and we're saying if you're higher than 200 copies at baseline and non-integrated, and you clear your DNA, I'll deintensify you. I'll drop you to 60 gray. I'll drop you to five doses or 200 of platinum. So it's a modest deintensification, but again, T4 smoker. But so this is how we're trying to build on Bish and others' work is can we find a group where they're clinically high risk, but the assay gives you equipoise, right? The assay says, no, 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 this person is going to do well, and vice versa, right? Let the assay tell you if someone who's clinically low risk might do poorly. And so in the future, what you could envision in a follow-up trial is intensifying the lower risk arm. The patient who is negative for DNA at baseline, T4 smoker with failure to clear, that's a big problem, right? That's a scary problem. If they get chemo RT, that's the person who I would advocate probably needs more adjuvant therapy like immunotherapy. So we're working on um, integrating that. But this trial is ongoing, and you can see how the story is evolving. Very cool stuff. Yeah. So maybe we would pause. We put up a few questions, but we would pause for some questions based on the use during treatment.
Raymond Sang from Singapore. Thanks for the uh, very wonderful talk. I mean, this is really sim is it similar to the DBV DNA we've been using in Asia for 15 years, monitoring nasal pharynx cancer. So as a surgeon, my question is, is this test able to, for recurrent cases, sensitive enough to pick up small recurrences that are amenable to surgical treatment? I mean, um, we know that in EVV DNA, they are not very useful. But a lot of times when they come up again, they're probably metastatic, and it's not, I mean, we can't offer a cure. We want to pick up these patients early enough. It, can this test do the I, I'm going to say that we're going to get there because we have to get to the surveillance and the use in the recurrent metastatic setting, okay. but I'll give you one case just to answer the question. I have a patient with advanced disease, chemo radiation, sorry, locally advanced, treated, NAVDX cleared. It was positive at baseline. A few months later, their scans were negative. They were not getting more imaging because they were a stage one. Their NAVDX became positive. I got a PET scan. There was a single one centimeter area in the liver that was hot. Would never have been picked up until they presented with symptoms. We yes. did SBRT. The patient cleared. I just took an oligometastatic patient, put them back into remission, and I would argue with you that that did not improve their survival. And so this test, it's not for everyone that it can do that, but there's a clear group of HPV patients where you clear their oligometastatic disease and you cure them. And you can ask any med -onc who's honest that those exist. If we can pick those up with a, a minimal re residual disease test, you are doing better by your patients. So the answer is yes. Thank you. I, I think there are also some, just from a surgical perspective, um, there are a number of trials that are actually in a prospective fashion, hoping to ask that very question. What is the sensitivity? How precise can this be for um, minimal residual disease? And I think there's a, a, there are studies in Boston, there's a study at Emory, there's a study that we're considering for the NRG. Please come to my talk at 11 uh, tomorrow. Uh, I don't know what room it's in, uh, so there's a more fulsome discussion about that. But as we move on, just to respond, we, I, I don't know if you're seeing these super young patients, but I have a, an, another patient, in 40. Uh, I'm 55 now, so 40 seems really young. Um, but, uh, and uh, same, same scenario, so uh, tonsil resection, nodal uh, neck, and, you know, um, one node, three centimeters, and we decided not to radiate. 18 months later, this test, I didn't have a, 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 a a, uh, a baseline for him. It sort of happened when I was starting to incorporate this into my practice. He had a level 5B recurrence that um, he was vaguely sensitive of, and, and that actually, the NAPTX actually correlated and predicted that, and uh, we found a 1.5 by 2 centimeter lymph, uh, lymph node met. I did an ECT dissection. He had RT, and um, he's hopefully going to do well. But it, that case, I think, shows the potential for actually using this to help um, surgically de escalate as well. Dr. Klusman. Just a short question from Europe. So is the test always positive or negative? I mean, you showed the two, two, which is... Yes. What is it? Is yes. it also positive? So there's a little bit of a complex answer, given how much data has been generated. For HPV subtype 16, the test is copies per ml normalized to a score over thousands of patients and thousands of tests. I'm told 33,000 tests have already been done across 400 plus institutions in the US already. So with that data, a score above two is considered positive for HPV positive 16 subtype and is reported as a normalized value. In the score range of around two to three, patients are considered intermediate, but you'll have the value. So you should treat it as a positive. To your point, Peter, if it's negative, it says not detected, which is, again, implying less than two. The only difference is with the non-16 subtypes, because they're rarer and there's less data, but there's still a lot of it, the cutoff for indeterminate is a little higher as the data emerges, right? The test gets better and better and better at picking up lower volume disease as it's normalized across patients. So you will always get a number, and you'll always get either undet not detectable or detectable, but anything at two and higher in 16 subtype is reported. Dr. Lango. Yes, uh, Miriam Lango from MD Anderson. A uh, question about um, the baseline levels of being like less than 200 versus greater than 200. I guess if the values are less than 200, it's, le it's more unfavorable. Uh, does that apply to patients who undergo surgery or just patients who undergo chemo radiation? Yeah, so that was, uh, you know, our <laughs> very early data. And, you know, that cutoff, I think, 
um, is we're, tr we're learning about what's the right cutoff for different kinds of patients and stages and et cetera, et cetera. So that's to be determined and with, with more research. And I would agree right now, a lot of that data and building on our trial has been from the chemo radiation population, but you're absolutely right. I know MSK has a trial um, that's looking at a 50 cutoff. I think it's an important point. You have to start somewhere, but I think the target of what is integrated and what's not is still evolving. There is an effort to work on a companion integration assay, so that would help validate some of that low baseline value. And another uh, anecdote just to respond to Peter's question. So a uh, 72-year-old uh, uh, lawyer from Napa has a just great TORS case, 2.1, single node here. Um, I got an AVDX on him. It was zero. And it was very clearly squamous cell carcinoma that was P16 positive. We subtyped him. He was 18, right? So I'm not using this to follow him in that case. So I think, you know, this is an exciting new area. It's an area that you've been working on for years and others in the room have been working on for years. Um, and I think it really is going to behoove us to capture large data sets to really answer these questions because the precision with which we can potentially correlate a biomarker to this disease um, really has to, has, has to begin now. Um, and we have another question. Thank you. Um, Peter Dranilevsky from the University of Florida. Uh, my question for you guys is, uh, what are you doing in a TORS case where pre-op the patient has a, you know, a number of like 100, 200, highly detectable, and then post-op, zero. But on their final path report, they have indications for adjuvant treatment. Are there any um, indications that are absolute where you tell the patient, I don't care that it's zero, I still think you really need radiation, or are, is it case-by-case case basis, or what are your thoughts on that? How do you approach that? Yeah, that let's setting? be really clear. The assay is not approved right now to make decisions off of a trial, okay? So the answer to that question, I hope Bish agrees, is if there are indications like PNI or LVI or close margins or nodes, you give radiation as a standard answer, even when they clear. What I was saying is in a clinical trial setting that we have, for example, if someone is in the, in the TORS arm on the trial and they have a, negative, a good path response, but they don't clear, we will not de-escalate their radiation regardless. But I think you're, it'll take some time for us, but the trials that you're talking about or envisioning are happening now at institutions. So we should have some data about what to do with a negative NAVDX and positive NAVDX post-op. But right now, you, you go with your path. And, and I, I agree with my, my, both my panelists here. I am absolutely not de-escalating based on, the, on this. It's, it's a nice reinforcement of our right. clinical. But I'll tell you what that does introduce when you share this information with the patient. I can think of three gentlemen right now. Once you tell them they're zero, I'm like, well, why are you making me do this? I mean, so I, I think that actually goes back to the very early, earliest assessment of that patient when you say, hey, look, there's this study, it's clear approved, but we're really testing how it should be used clinically. I'm not gonna make a decision based on this level, but it might give you some insight that, 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 that helps you sleep better at night and gives you a perspective on your disease. It's really important to say that upfront. Yeah. yeah, perfect. So we're gonna move to surveillance because we talked about preach. Oh yes, one more question. I think it'll help us to escalate. I think the correlate to that question is when we, after surgery, it's still positive, even though the pathology looks great. I think that's the part where actually we can actually increase or intensify the therapy for, for the people who may actually revert if we don't do it. So we're doing that now yeah. in our trial. If you're a good risk feature and you clear, you, you go to observation. If you're detectable by an ABDX, even if you have good risk features, you get radiation. So yeah. we're working on that. And again, I think it points to the importance of multicenter collaboration. It's great to roll these concepts out as pilot concepts, but we're never going to get the numbers we need to get to get the answers that we, we, we so crave. Yeah. Thank you for the wonderful questions. We're going to move on now to the surveillance setting. Uh, there is good data now that CTHB DNA, particularly measuring TTMV in the surveillance setting, has a, a high utility in detecting cancer recurrences in our patients with HPV or France cancer. So this is another prospective study. Uh, where uh, it was, uh, patients were uh, you know, enrolled, uh, treated uniformly with chemoradiotherapy, and had surveillance blood tests measured uh, every three to six months post treatment. And what was shown in this study was that if you have a negative NAVDX, the, the negative predictive values test was 100%. If it's negative, you're in remission, you don't have a cancer recurrence. 
if the blood test becomes po has if a patient has two consecutive positive NABDX tests, that is highly predictive, almost a, a high net positive predictive value of there being a recurrence. Um, and this in this study uh, and other people's anecdotal experience now and now published experience, it does it does uh, detect small recurrences. So uh, this is a case of one of my patients. Uh, this is a 70-year-old uh, person, a non-smoker, who had a, a T3N2 a P16 positive oropharynx cancer. And uh, I actually, in, in, my, in my practice, I check at pretreatment. I check at four weeks, and I send an email to the company saying I need a blood test back right now because I, I, I want to know what it shows because it actually informs on whether I de-intensify. And um, so I got the, the pretreatment was positive. The four week, it didn't clear, it only cleared like 50%. So I we treated this patient to 70 gray. And this is the pretreatment PET scan showing a, you know, a large tonsil cancer on the right bilateral neck nodes. And so when we compare the pretreatment PET, which is on the far left, to the three month post-treatment PET, you can see that there's this equivocal avidity still in the left level two node. And you know, what does this mean? You know, we know the positive predictive value of PET scans post-treatment in an HPV or a cancer is not good, okay? But this, this is a patient who sees this in their my chart before I can get into the room and is very uh, disappointed. Like I thought, you know, why is there still cancer here? I said, well, we're gonna get the, we're gonna get the NAVDX and uh, we're gonna repeat the PET scan because that's, you know, what the tumor board recommends. And so the NAVDX was, was undetectable at that three months post-treatment PET. So then we repeat the PET in two months, it's still not completely negative in that neck node, right? Uh, and we repeated the NAVDX, and it was negative. And so this is just showing you um, this patient's uh, clearance kinetics as well as surveillance results. So pretreatment, you know, 133 fragments. I checked it at week four of radiation. I, was, I totally thought this was going to be undetectable. You know, non-smoker, healthy person should be. No, it didn't clear like the, what the, our data had shown before that for a favorable clearance and kinetics profile. So I actually told the patient we have to go to 70. Uh, and the patient understood, and we went to 70 gray, and then post-treatment PET scan uh, at three months, and then again, uh, five months, uh, undetectable. So this is the follow-up paper to the original, to Bish's original observations in JCO. Many of you may be familiar, this was the, the burger paper, if you will, uh, but that I was able to work with uh, Barry and uh, many institutions on, some of which the representatives are in this room. But this was over 1,000 patients across over 130 centers, uh, accumulating data, looking at retrospectively what you could do with this test in terms of predicting uh, positive predictive value uh, during surveillance. So how well does a, a, a test that becomes positive during surveillance tell you that someone may have disease? And the bottom line is it's very good. Um, and so if you look here, you know, essentially it's, it's actually higher now, but of the patients who had no clinically evident or indeterminate disease on your exam or your imaging, if they were positive for HPV DNA and that was persistent, almost all of them ended up having a cancer event. Now you may look at this and say originally it was 93%, but over time it goes higher and if you stop and think that makes sense because eventually you find the cancer and that's an important point to, to remind you. Just because you get a negative imaging study doesn't mean that, that, imaging, that there are not cells floating around that's detected on the DNA that you're not seeing. And so what happens is if you follow these people long enough, that positive predictive value now, if you remember from the two by two table we showed you initially, is like 95 to 96%. And that's better than a PET scan. So keep that in mind. You know, people say, well, imaging this and that. And I'm like, well, at the same time, this is a molecularly derived test. The other thing I want to point out for those of you in surgery, and we're all sort of siphoned in head and neck, go look around oncology. Okay, FDA approval already for ctDNA testing to give adjuvant therapy in colorectal cancer, triple negative breast cancer, you name it. We are late to the game. Wrap your head around this. It exists everywhere. But it's like as an oncologist, a medical oncologist, I need to enlighten people to realize like we're way behind. So just keep that in mind as you think about these data. Thanks, Glenn. Yeah. <laughs> I and thought so, we were doing a good job. Yeah, you, we're doing all right. Um, you're all present. That's how that helps. Um, so if this is an example, 59-year-old former smoker, you know, big tumor. You can see it there in the oropharynx with nodal involvement and got, you know, appropriately chemo radiation. And this is where the test becomes important in surveillance. Look at these kinetics. Huge score at, at baseline, drops during treatment, clears, but oh look, starts to climb. And I'll tell you, when this patient hit six, we got a PET scan, it was negative. 
when the patient was, then we followed them to five. And you look at the dates here. We went every four weeks. We went really close. Long story short, this patient ended up having uh, lung metastases, which I picked up early because I hawked this test and we resected the lung metastases. So now you can argue with me, well, Glenn, you resected the lung metastases. Does that change their overall survival? Well, I will remind you that there is a prospective well-done radiation trial that showed us that oligometastatic radiation to several sites, if I recall, uh, improves overall survival in patients. So why wouldn't it make sense that cutting out little baby metastases when they're early, I'm not talking about a widely metastatic patient, I'm talking about early, might not improve survival. It's gonna take me a long time and to get much older than Chris to figure this out, but it <laughs> makes sense biologically. So, all right, more questions about the surveillance component. Yeah, the question was whether in the original study that Bish did, they saw a signal for stronger correlation with a two consecutive positive tests and whether you really need the two, Bish? Yeah, so, you know, we're gonna, Glenn's gonna show this data, but no, now it's just, you know, one. Agreed. So that's helpful to know. Is that the top head and neck surgeon in the world? There? No, that's our former fellow, Mike Toff, sorry for the shameless plug. Mike Toff, Vanderbilt. Um, I like the test, I've been using it for the past year. I particularly like it in the the post-treatment phase, given the poor uh, positive predictive value of PET scans. That being said, uh, as a community, when can we expect some data to show that the test improves outcomes, and how are you going to account for lead time bias? Yeah, so this is going to take a long time, as you know, Mike. I mean, so we have a prospective surveillance trial that was designed with patients consented. They get tested, they get their treatment, and we follow them. And Eleni and I designed it to 180 patients at the Dana-Farber to the rate at which the test picks up uh, recurrence before a scan or at the time of a scan or biopsy. So that's the first step, right? That's the prospective signal that it works to detect disease. But you're right. The next question is, okay, I pick up something six months in advance. So I'll show you how I think this test could change outcomes. So let's say you have an advanced patient who gets chemo radiation. You start to see it trickling up like that. You get imaging um, and you don't see anything. Maybe that's the person that needs immunotherapy or a therapeutic HPV vaccine to clear low residual disease or MRD positive disease. That's not a new concept. Have you ever heard of leukemia? When people have MRD positive disease, they get chemotherapy. So this, we have to open our eyes to how this is. This is molecularly positive disease. Just because you don't see it and you don't see it on your exam doesn't mean it's not there. And so what I would argue is if we start doing trials that treat patients for MRD positivity, which there are some being designed now, we will start to see improvements in outcome by using immunotherapies and therapeutic vaccines early to clear disease. But you're right, that's not gonna happen in three years, it's not gonna happen in five years. It's probably gonna be close to eight to 10 years, but you know what, we still have to do it. The question I have is for those of us that are at a tumor board where there's some amount of clinical intuition and buy into this idea of how it can inform your decision making, how do you have that conversation with maybe your radiation oncologist or your medical oncologist who aren't necessarily at this meeting or haven't necessarily reviewed the data to say, you know, what well, the argument of this should not be used for specific reasons, et cetera, but we're kind of making, talking about this gray area, right, where we don't have all the data to support all of those decisions, but we're all saying, look how this can help you with some of those patients that are kind of in this nebulous area and still do what's right. How do you discuss it with your colleagues that are not yeah, surgical? I, surgical. Right, right, right. Well, you know, I think, I, you know, repeating what Glenn said, we are way behind in the CT DNA space, you know, and um, I don't know what the bias is with head and neck oncologists in this area, but it, it's something that I, I, people ask this question, like, a lot. I mean, you know, what, what convinces a person? Data, you know, and sometimes it's just you use it on a patient, you see the value, you know, that, oh, my gosh, I detected oligometastatic disease, and we treated it, and the patient's now in remission a year or two out. You know, I know we want big studies. We do need that. We're evidence-based. We have to be evidence-based. Uh, but, you know, we're not saying right now that, you know, that we, the future is going to be that this that CT DNA in cancer, and it already is doing that, but it, even in our field, is going to change the way we take care of patients. It will. And we have a huge advantage with HPV-associated disease because there are all these huge startups in Silicon Valley trying to figure out what the next CT DNA biopsy is for lung cancer. 
uh, and they don't have a target, and we do, and so that's why I think doing these small pilot studies that converge into larger studies are, are, are going to help us get the data for the skeptics. And I also, besides, I completely agree, and I wouldn't add more, but I just want to talk about the patient perspective, because a lot of people come up to me and say, well, what happens when it's positive and the scans are negative and you're producing scan anxiety for the patient? The anxiety is for you. You're anxious. The patient wants to know. And I've been using this test for several years, hundreds and hundreds of patients. When they have a positive NAVDX, they're not upset. They want to know where the cancer is, and I would argue it's your job to find it or think about a trial or a way to intervene earlier that we can get rid of minimal residual disease. So I always want to stress, put your comfort, discomfort aside. You're the one who's uncomfortable that you have a positive result and you don't know what to do with it, but the patient is empowered, and they deserve to understand whether they have minimal residual disease, and we as a community need to figure out how to treat it. That, that's true, but some of the triumvirate may disagree here. But, um, you know, we, but we may create anxiety. Uh, that in the short term, and so I think as we talk about how we all approach this from our different disciplines, I think there's definitely going to need to be a sort of a patient-derived anxiety scale of, as we incorporate this into practice that did not think of, think of this. So to that point, and this speaks to the genius of the surgeon Eleni Reddick, in the prospective trial I just referenced, we incorporated a fear of recurrence score reported by the patient on the trial at every time point, including an EORTC score throughout the entire trial. Right. So we will have quality of life that says what your patients actually want and whether they feel like they have less or more fear of recurrence based on having the assay. So we will get that information very soon. Uh, we invited Eleni, but I think she was double booked. Are you here? Did you come at the end of your other fight? She is Okay, I'm booked. giving her enough props. Okay. <laughs> well, are you her agent? <laughs> but I'm a strong collaborator. Oh, there you go. Other questions? Liz Fransman from uh, University of Miami. Um, I, had a, I just wanted to go back to the diagnosis section, which I know is a little bit more experimental. We often will get unknown primaries, and I know it was brought up. Um, and living in sunny Florida, it really does become an issue sometimes distinguishing between um, skin, cutaneous and oral. And I'm wondering if there is actual data, because from what I've read, some of the cutaneous squames can also be HPV driven. So do we, is it really something that can distinguish that would help our tumor board? Because some people believe that this test could and others don't. I don't know that I would say that there's like a mass, there will be eventually, right, a series that describes this because these are small numbers from different institutions, but I would say it it's helps you, right? So if you have a patient where it's equivocal, I mean, the rates of HPV, truly HPV-associated skin cancer are pretty low, um, and so if you have a level two node or someone who sort of fits the demographics and you're not sure, I mean, it might help you is the only thing I would say in terms of whether there's mucosal, you know, a source of mucosal disease, but I don't think we know for sure. Okay. That's a great question because oftentimes I, I'll think it's squame in the MET and then I've got to do tours on that patient. I'm like, no, why am I doing this? But it's P16 positive, it's HPV positive, and we're obliged. This is a great uh, idea for a study. And sometimes, just full disclosure, I actually send um, one of the commercially available non-HPV assays, so Signatera has a tumor-informed ctDNA test, or Natera, excuse me, and sometimes I'll do both to understand what biologically is happening. Because a lot of these tests are available, it's just, you, you know, use the tools in front of you to try to get the most information. Okay. Thank you. Uh, just a, a practical question, as somebody who practices in a community hospital, who pays for this? Yeah, I'm happy to take that one. Um, okay, so as a, a very, yeah, so let's be clear about this. So initially, um, NAVDX uh, is CLIA certified and clinically available, meaning as you've learned, you can order it and set it up in your hospital. You fill out a form, you fill in a blood kit, and it gets sent off, okay, to their lab in Waltham, and then they return a result to you um, in a paper form or an electronic form. So how does the patient get billed? Um, of course, this is not a free assay, and so initially when the company launched in 2020, there was a lot of, as many circulating tumor DNA platforms do, there's an initial pay it forward period so that people can start using it and get comfortable. So initially there was no billing. If, the, if a bill was sent to a provider for the test, or to, excuse me, who a payer, and the payer declined, then there would be a statement of benefits, but the patient would not receive a bill. Only recently, because the test is now very clinically available and because the company needs to obviously you know, grow in its business and be able to provide this test, this important test for our patients, patients are now starting to see a bill. And my understanding of how it works, because we just went through this, is if the patient's insurance completely denies the test, 
they will again get a statement of benefit, and then but the company will not charge the patient. They will not seek anything from the patient. If the insurance, their insurance, and it's insurance dependent, says they'll cover a portion of the test, the patient is responsible for whatever the copay deductible is to their cap, which is how the rest of labs work in this world. So it's very reasonable. They do have a copay assistance program, I'm told, based on household income, which is great. And I've heard that there's no interest in like collections and things like that. So that summarizes a very complicated discussion that this is not something that a patient whose insurance denies could not have access to, but if their insurance pays part of it as appropriate, they'll be responsible for the copay. But I do think you need to talk to your patients and just say, this is an important test like your PSA, like your TSH, like that extra pet you want to get, and have a conversation about whether you and your patient feel comfortable with that. But they do need to have a strategy to move forward with uh, providing the test, but not for free. So we have to assess for anxiety and fu potential financial toxicity. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Follow-up question to this one. Oh. May oh, yeah, I? Please go ahead, Claudia. They're going to bring uh, up. A follow-up question to this one: uh, What's the cost of this test? Uh, can you be specific? It's the cost to the patient, the bill test to an insurance. I actually happen to know. A lot uh, well, of this I stuff. live in Brazil and I practice in Brazil. So, <laughs> and you don't have a rep in Brazil so no, far. And I don't want to my knowledge, but yeah. uh, uh, as a practical question, yep, so I'll if we it. are going, how, how how much does it cost here in the states? Yep. So, um, and again, I'm a practitioner, so that's what I see. And there are some Navaris people in the room who can give you a bigger answer. My understanding, please correct me, is that uh, the bill test for sort of like an insurance would be around. $1,600, which is about average for a circulating tumor test. Nevera, or a Signatera is over $3,000. Just to give you a comparator, a PET scan with read is $2,500. So just want to put things into context for okay. you. $60, by the way, for a CBC in the United States. And so if you take a payer model, generally a patient's not going to pay more than I've seen as low as $30 for a test or coverage of a copay, up to, depending on the insurance, even $800, because that insurance was not willing to pay more. But remember, that hits a cap. So if you're checking a few times a year, they're not going to keep getting billed. But that's the range I've observed as a practicing physician. Thank you. That, that was a follow-up question after Russ's question. Yes, uh, but uh, uh, excuse me, just may oh, I? Just a quick one. Yeah. Uh, Chris, you showed some two provocative cases there uh, at the beginning. Yeah. And in our tumor board in the Albert Einstein Jewish Hospital, uh, when we decide the line of treatment for a patient, we, meaning go for TORS or go for chemoradiation, et cetera, et cetera. We base that on the uh, extent, the amount of detectable disease. So you show the very, very high level of that circulating antibodies before treatment. So my question, my practical question to you is, do you base uh, your decision in your tumor board, I mean the tumor board base the decision uh, of which kind of line of treatment you are going to adopt uh, on the level of the pre-treatment levels of uh, circulating hormones? No. For now, no. But I think you know, using ctDNA in the future, maybe. So I just want to clarify a few points. This is, a, this is a DNA test, right? So not antibody tests. But then the second thing was, I said this earlier, the baseline value, there's a paper published on this, JAMA Otolaryngology, last year, Lenny Reddig, of our 180 patients, baseline value gives you some evidence of nodal involvement. What it does not tell you is how big the primary is. It doesn't necessarily correlate with uh, T4 versus T2. So again, an individual's biology and shed and apoptosis gets you different values. But please don't walk away thinking, oh, I'm 40,000 and my other patient started at 250. They're, they have different, you know, this person's worse. We don't know that yet. It may end up being that it's just an intrinsic biologic level. What's most important is the individual trend. Follow the, your own patient. If it's a tenfold drop, it doesn't matter where they started. So keep that in mind. Thank but you. We're early days, early days, and we gotta get the data and then do the analysis. I think people are going to start, speaking of shedding, we're going to start shedding yeah. participants. <laughs> but if there are any final questions. But, uh, Just a quick practical question, we'll wrap up. Uh, Freedom Johnson from Cleveland. What are you using as your post-treatment 
timing in terms yeah. of first test and then frequency and so, duration? Uh, it depends. For us at Dana-Farber, we're heavy users. Pre-op, we do an immediate post-op or with at least within a few weeks, and then we follow the NCCN every three to four months for the first two years, and then every six months thereafter and annually in years five and beyond. Um, for chemo radiation, similarly, we just do it after the chemo radiation ends within about four weeks. But again, I think we've got to figure out, like, we're not going to not order imaging. And so, like, we can't keep adding things on. And so how we figure this out, we'll, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. Um, Thank you. It was really exciting to have such a big room. I'm bummed no one took a picture. Uh, Dr. Uh, Chera, Hannah, and I will be sticking around if you have any further questions. Thank you very much.